when Paul cries, O wretched man that I am, he makes it very plain that in the Christian sin remains, disturbs and vexes, but it cannot ruin while we're looking to Jesus. There's so many examples of this in Scripture. The Old Testament as well as the New is full of illustrations of what the grace of God does. Remember the story of Jehoiachin told twice in the Old Testament? How he was 37 years in prison, helpless, unable to get out, becoming weaker and weaker, older and older. He'd been a rebel against the king. And one day a new king came and spoke graciously to him, changed his prison garments, lifted him out of the prison, made him a king again, and sat him at the royal table. What a beautiful picture of the gospel. We were once kings and queens in Eden, so to speak, and we rebelled, and we've been in bondage, in captivity. But King Jesus comes, and he speaks graciously to us. He lifts us out of the prison house. He closes with his garment of righteousness. He sits us at the royal table. He makes provision for us. Read the story at the end of Second Kings. Think of the story of Mephibosheth, the crippled prince, stolen in 2 Samuel 9. Because of rebellion against David and Absalom's ancestors, he'd been in exile. But one day he sees a messenger coming from the land of Israel. And the messenger says, King David's inviting you to the palace. And when he comes, the king speaks to him graciously and softly and kindly. And Mephibosheth says, how do you talk to a dead dog like me in this way? He wasn't only an exile, he was a cripple by a fall when he was very young. He represents all of us. We've been in exile because of sin. We're of princely line, Adam and Eve were king and queen. We were crippled by a fall, the fall in Eden. But then a messenger comes from our David. We come out of exile. Read the story. David made him a prince again, sat him at the royal table, and in the royal garment you couldn't see Mephibosheth was crippled. And that's how God deals with us. The robe of righteousness. He counts us perfect, though we're far from perfect. And I love the story of Peter. Peter who petered out. As Christ stands before the judges, Peter denies him with cursing and swearing. But it says, The Lord turned and looked at Peter. If he'd looked with anger, Peter would have suicided like Judas. But Christ looked and said, Peter, I love you still. Our sin may be mighty, but it's impotent to staunch the love of Christ. All our sins are a grain of sand alongside the mighty mountain of the love of God. All our sins are but a, a spark dropping into the ocean of God's mercy. God's more willing to forgive than a mother is to rescue her child from a burning house. Christ loves not the echo of ours. His love's not at the mercy of our fluctuating emotions. Our failures no more change his love toward us than the seasons affect the sun. His love is like that of 1 Corinthians 13. It suffers long and is kind. That's what breaks our heart. We're moving now into chapter 8. This is the great chapter of the Spirit. If you are a mature Christian, this chapter should tell out your experience. It's a chapter of freedom. I won't take time to number all the verses, but if I'm going down the chapter and it says we're free from condemnation and free from sin and death, free from flesh, the flesh, free from the war, the rebellion, meaning in an absolute sense. It doesn't mean there won't be battles, but it means they'll never conquer us in the long run. Free from slavery, free from fear, free from poverty, spiritual poverty, free from meaninglessness, hopelessness, decay, impatience, weakness, ignorance, despair, loneliness, defeat, need, accusation, separation. I've gone down the whole chapter. Read it for yourselves. Whole list of freedoms that come to the Christian. Many of these things still exist in the Christian life, but they cannot dominate us anymore. We're free from their tyranny. They can only annoy. They cannot separate us. And it's all through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember, objectively, Christ is everything. Subjectively, faith is everything, because faith is the hand that takes hold of Christ. This chapter about the Holy Spirit is the most exhaustive passage on the topic 
in the New Testament, except for John 14 to 16. There Christ has said, I'll give you another comforter. Comforter means a parakletos, one called alongside the help. The meaning of the Holy Spirit is this, that God has come down to help. He's as verily on earth today with every believer as Christ was on earth in the days of his flesh. God is alongside to help and inside to help for every emergency. The Christian's never alone, need never feel lonely, need never feel inadequate, need never feel afraid. We do, but we needn't. Because looking to Jesus and realizing our wealth, don't be surprised by your own moderation. Don't be moderate. According to your faith, be it unto you. Claim. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly. He'll never leave us or forsakes us. He'll give us power over all the power of the enemy. Read it in Luke 10, 19 and 20. So this is a chapter about the gifts of the Spirit, the freedom. And I want you to notice particularly verse 5. It says, Those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. My friend, if you want a mature Christian life, you must set your mind on the things of the Spirit. What folly to think that God's going to give eternity to people who think about him two minutes a day. Set your mind. Whatever gets your attention gets you. If you watch television for more than you study the truth of God, you're in a bad way. If your free money, the money that's over and above, keeping you alive and your loved ones, if your free money is mainly spent in selfish pursuits rather than in forwarding the gospel of God, you're in a bad position. Set your mind, set your mind, set your mind. Whatever gets your attention gets you. This chapter talks about the battle of Romans 7. Some people say, get out of Romans 7 into Romans 8. That's not correct. If you read verse 10, if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. And then it tells us in verse 13, if you live according to this flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. The struggle's still there, or mortifying still, but looking to the Spirit, he'll do it as we trust in Christ. Verse 14, all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. You didn't receive the spirit of slavery to fall back again into fear. You've received the spirit of sonship when we cry, Abba, Father. It's the Spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit. We are children of God. Friends, it's our privilege to know we're God's children. We're not perfect children, but we're perfectly his children. The Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. Samuel Wesley said on his deathbed, the inner witness, the inner witness, my friends. If you belong to Christ, if you've accepted the fact he died for you, the Spirit will tell you of God's love for you, and you will rejoice in that. Your Spirit and his will speak together to the heart and the mind with the awareness that God loves you still. That's the inner witness. And that inner witness will be documented by the outward walk. That's why it says as many as are led by the Spirit of God. It's a walk. A walk's an interrupted stumble. But we're led by the Spirit of God. We should know we belong to him. If the penitent thief could say that paradise was his before he died, why can't we? He didn't have much sanctification in him, but he had a genuine faith in Christ. Then in verse 18 he says, the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed. From verse 18 on he's talking about glorification. Particularly note verse 22. We know the whole creation has been groaning and travailed together until now. Not only the creation, we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Dear friends, there is a groan until the end. There is a conflict until the end. There's a battle until the end. Sin remains, but it doesn't reign until the end. There'll never be a day in our lives when the shadow of Satan is not cast athwart our pathway. But despite the groan, there's no condemnation. And despite the groan, sin need not dominate our lives, though it will vex us and annoy us and taunt us and tempt us till we cry out, O wretched man. 
Glorification is when this vile body is changed, when every cell of the mind is transformed, where all the evil tendencies of the law of sin in our members is removed, when we become whole again, fully, evidently, really, not just imputed, but by impartation, the sons of God. When this mortal shall put on immortality, and this corruptible shall put on incorruption, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Until glorification, we remain in conflict. But there's the hope of that glorious day, the redemption of the body. Notice in the last verse of this great chapter, it says in verse 31, If God is for us, who's against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also freely give us all things with him? That's great. If he gave us the greater, he'll give us the lesser. The lesser things we need, not all our wants. The worst thing that could happen is to get all we want. But all we need, made sure, guaranteed, if he gave the greater, he'll give the less. And in verse 37, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. So these things are mentioned above, tribulation, distress. Yes, a Christian has troubles, but suppose you give up your Christianity. You'll have tenfold more. None of these things need to separate us. This chapter begins with no condemnation, it ends with no separation. Isn't that great? All these things we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What blessed words. We can have confidence. Whatever's coming, he'll be there. God and you together can meet anything. <clears throat> the spirit within you will guide. The providence of God will deliver. Sometimes he delivers by letting us fall asleep. Sometimes death is a deliverance. But it's only asleep. <clears throat> In chapters 9, 10 and 11, Paul deals with the problem, why didn't the Jews accept this good news? And he has a good answer. Look at verse 30 of chapter 9. What shall we say then? The Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness have attained it. That is righteousness through faith. But that Israel who pursued the righteousness which is based on law did not succeed in fulfilling that law. Why? Because they didn't pursue it through faith. But as it were based on works. Now notice chapter 10. Verse 3. Being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God seeing to establish their own, they didn't submit to God's righteousness. My friends, these chapters are often misused to teach individual predestination to heaven or hell as a fixed decree from eternity. This is a wrong use. The whole question is why a nation rejected the gospel. It's not the issue of why some individuals are saved and some lost. And Paul's answer is that the ones who are lost are not lost because of an eternal decree, but because of righteousness by works, instead of submitting to the righteousness of God. Please note that well. You should notice also that in chapter 11, Paul never says anything about the restoration of Israel to Palestine, the setting up of a temple, and the sacrifices starting again. There's none of that in Paul, but there is a hint that many Jews will be saved at the last. I'm reading from chapter 11, and notice please, what it says in verse 23. Even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in. Verse 25. A hardening's come upon part of Israel till the full number of the Gentiles shall come in. And so all Israel will be saved. When it says so all Israel shall be saved, it certainly doesn't mean every Jew. Remember back in 9 and verse 6 it said, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So not all the descendants can be numbered among all Israel. Not all the children of Abraham because they're his descendants, but through Isaac shall your descendants be named. This means it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are reckoned as descendants. So Paul is saying every Jew who accepts the gospel becomes part of the true Israel of God. And in the last days he's hinting that many will, but there's nothing here about a restoration of Palestine. Most of the Jews in Palestine are atheists. To set the temple going, as some dispensationalists teach, would be to contradict the finality of Calvary. It's a blasphemous thought. Now in chapter 12, 
He asks us to surrender our bodies to him and to be good stewards of the grace of God. Look at it, chapter 12. I appeal to you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. My, that's a mouthful. He uses a priestly term when he says, present your bodies. That's a priestly word, present. And then he says, your bodies must be a living sacrifice. Dear friends, most Christians are a disgrace to God, the way they treat their bodies. Most Christians have forgotten that the body is holy, for it's the temple of the living God. And whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we must do all the glory of God. We're not saved by fastidious habits of diet or by becoming a jogger. But I tell you, if one learns to live by the God-given laws of life, will run the race of faith much easier and much more successfully. Most people don't die, they suicide. Nine out of ten deaths are caused by what we put between our lips in the West. Three out of every ten die because of nicotine. One out of every ten dies because of alcohol. About another four out of every ten dies because of the excessive use of animal products. The Bible doesn't say you must be vegetarian, but it makes it very clear that such was the original diet. Why be cannibals? Why eat corpses? Don't think that the fish of today's world is as good as the fish that Christ ate. Don't even think that the flesh you get from the butchers is as good as it was before the use of hormones and antibiotics since the end of World War II. No, the Bible does not demand we be vegetarians, but it clearly teaches the nearer we can get to it, the healthier and the happier we'll be. Think of the image of a man. Look at the first of his head. What you think has a lot to do with your health. Sometimes it's not what you eat, but what's eating you. Then move down to the chest. Do you breathe enough? You know, good air is even more important than good food. Much more important. If you spend all your time indoors, you're asking for an early death. It's no good evening outdoors unless you're active. It's only when you're active you breathe fully. So walk to the glory of God. That's the best exercise for all people. Then come down to the stomach. We've looked at the head and the, and the chest. Now the stomach. Do you eat to the glory of God? What you eat and drink today is walking and talking tomorrow. Tremendously important what we eat. Eat live foods if you want to stay alive. Try and avoid stuff from packets and bottles and cans. They're only for emergencies. I use them for that too. But eat live food if you want to be alive. Food as God made it. What God's joined together, don't put asunder. Refined foods. White sugar, white flour, white bread. They're as dead as Julius Caesar. Eat unrefined products. Food is grown most of the time. Doesn't matter what you do occasionally. You can go to potlucks and to parties. Doesn't matter what you do occasionally. But habitually, remember, you are sowing by the way you eat. Everything we do affects our health. The way we sit, walk, stand, eat, sex, everything. Nothing we do is neutral. Your body is the temple of God. Care for it. Then Paul talks about all the gifts that Christ has given us. And the duties that grow out of these gifts, if you follow down these verses in chapter 12 and go on to 13, you'll find he talks about the duties of the justified to God, verses 1 and 2, to ourselves in verse 3, to the church, verses 4 to 8, to individual believers outside of ourselves in verses 9 to 13, to enemies, 14 to 21, to the state in chapter 13, to our neighbours in the last part of chapter 13, then our duties to the weak in chapter 14, and our duties to everybody in Romans 15 and verse 8. Remember, religion is grace, but ethics is gratitude. When our hearts are broken by the love of God, we'll live differently. We realize we're not our own. We belong to him. We're a debtor to everybody for all we have that they don't have. We're to be ministers to everybody. Owe no man anything but to love one another. If I'm a Christian, I owe the debt of unselfish love. You may not like them, but you can love them. Liking is a something that comes and goes. 
Christian love is a principle. You can do it to enemies, to wicked people. You don't countenance evil, you resist it. But you must love your enemies. I'm to owe all men the debt of love. When you come to chapter 14, it tells about the limits of liberty. Paul says, don't let anyone tell you what you're to do on every day or how you're to eat in every detail. He's not saying contrary to what we've just said, but he's warning against that legalism that tries to dictate in minutia. This is a chapter that's known as the chapter of the adiaphora. That means the things that are indifferent, things that are not important. Paul is saying, don't tell anyone you've got to fast on certain feast days. So some count one day better than another, and some eat vegetables rather than foods offered to idols. It's discussing the habits of eating in connection with certain festival days. And Paul says, don't let other people tell you what to do, but also try and not be a stumbling block. There are limits to liberty. The liberty of my fist stops when the other person's nose approaches. I'm not to set a stumbling block before anybody. It's in this chapter we read the great verse in verse 17, the kingdom of God doesn't mean food and drink, but righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Right food and drink will increase your righteousness, peace and joy. No doubt about that. Most of us are sick because we choose to. Some of us are sick because it's something that's happened to us by accident or by inheritance. Let's wipe out the part that belongs to our choices. But when you do, remember that's only the minutia. Righteousness, peace and joy, these are the greatest things. Not the best you can do in nutrition. Then in the beginning, chapter 15, we were strong or to bear with the failings of the weak, not to please ourselves, that each of us please his neighbour for his good to edify him. There's a hard saying, we're not to please ourselves. Of course, the nearer we come to Christ, the easier it becomes to obey him. When we lift his yoke, we find it's light. His burden is light, his yoke is easy. If we lift the cross, it lifts us. When we hold it to our bosom, it holds us to the bosom of God. So Paul in these chapters 12 and onward is saying how we'll live if we're justified. How we'll live if sanctification is taking place in the life. For no one is saved without sanctification, yet no one is saved because of it. Why not because of it? Because it's never good enough. Remember, the righteousness of justification is 100%, but it's not inside us. The righteousness of sanctification is inside us, but it's never 100%. The righteousness of glorification will be both 100% and in us. Until then, we're dependent fully on the merits of Christ, however well we're doing, or however poorly we're doing. Remember, this is the book of the grace of God. This is a book about him who justifies the ungodly. This is the book that tells us that Abraham was justified before he was circumcised, before the moral law was given, before he brought forth a good son for God. This is the book that tells us that David's sin was not recorded, not counted against him. This is the book of grace. This is the book about the love of God that's shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit is given unto us. This is a book that assures us if we set our mind on the things of God, the flesh will not reign. We'll mortify the flesh. And it won't be hard because looking unto Jesus, he becomes sweeter and better, more wonderful than anything the devil can offer us. I want you to look briefly at the last chapter. Here's a chapter of worthies that reminds us of the heavenly roles of the saved. And see how prominent women are in it. Phoebe a deaconess. The word can be translated minister of the church. Of the church. And then in verse 3, Prisca and Aquila. Notice the woman's put first. She was more active in Christian work than a husband. See how Paul describes them. They risked their necks for my life. And then you'll notice in verse 7, greet Andronicus and Junia. Should be Junia, not Junius. There's no Juniuses in the early centuries of whom we have a record. The translators stumble over this being chauvinists. It's talking about a woman who with her husband is reckoned as apostles, not the twelve, but special workers for Christ. Notice a woman's included among them as an apostle. So it's a great chapter. But come to the end. When you get to verse 25, to him who's able to strengthen you. That's what I need. I'm so weak. But he's able to strengthen me. And then it talks about 
bringing about the obedience of faith. This epistle began with the obedience of faith and it ends with the obedience of faith. I'm so glad it's not the other way. It's not the faith of obedience. When you and I learn of Jesus Christ, down even to the minutia, friends, remember that on the cross he refused one cup and accepted another. He refused the drugged one. Now there's nothing wrong with using medicines for pain as they're needed. Don't use them excessively, you pay for every one of them. Every drug you use is like borrowing money. You pay it all back plus interest. But Christ refused the drug drink to teach us to discipline our desires. Sin began in Eden through undisciplined desire. Mature Christians must learn to discipline their desires. But this is the obedience of faith. It's only when we are charmed by Jesus. It's only when we behold how much better his way is than anything we could think out for ourselves. It's only then that we can obey him. That's the obedience of faith. So my friends, we've been looking at a wonderful book about a wonderful gospel, about the good, glad and merry tidings that makes the heart to sing and the feet to dance. Remember, in summary, it means looking to Jesus trusting him for what he's done, for what he's doing. He's living now to hear our prayers, to impart the Spirit, and trusting him for his coming again. Friends, remember Luther. If I look to myself, I don't see how I could ever be saved. When I look to Christ, I don't see how I could ever be lost. God bless you.